Hey guys, it's Mina. So I'm going to start reading from Genesis chapter 2, verse 8. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pisces. And that is it which composite the whole land of Havila, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The name of the same is it that composite the whole land of Ethiopia, and the name of the third river is Hidekel. That is it which goeth toward the east of Assyria, and the fourth river is Euphrates. And we know the River Euphrates plays uh, a role in um, the book of Revelation. So it's interesting that that area that um, is mentioned in um, Revelation, you know, where the Battle of Armageddon, uh, the army is going to uh, go across it or travel through the Euphrates, is that's one of the rivers that um, proceed or from the uh, Garden of Eden. So that locality is actually pretty significant anyways continue on and uh let's see what does god say 15 and the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou may mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die well, this is definitely what adam had told eve that if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall surely die okay now um what did what happened in genesis chapter 3 Verse 1, now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord had, Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Ye, yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So she did not remember what God had said. He didn't say, you can't touch it. I mean, but if you eat it, you shall surely die. So the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not surely die. Now, he, he, what was he referring to that you shall not surely die? What if, that, what if he was saying that if you touch it, you shall not surely die? Because she said, you shall not eat of it nor touch it. And of course she touched it. Nothing happened to her. Well, I didn't die and I touched it. Well, I guess I won't die when I eat it. I mean, he should just say, you, you shall not surely die. Yeah, you can touch it. <laughs> For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then ye, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Yeah, you can touch it. And nothing happens to you. You can surely eat it. You're going to be like God. You know, your eyes will be opened, knowing good and evil. Now, us today, we're like, we can care less about knowing evil. We don't even want evil in this world. Evil is just what's so present, so prevalent right now that's ruining our society. You know, even our very bodies is just ridden with sin, you know, and even our minds are so sin conscious, you know, um, our flesh sometimes, you know, like this is apart from Christ. Like when we were, um, as an unbeliever, like we're plagued in our minds and our bodies um depression so many emotional issues uh th this world is sinful right so we going back in time we were like eve eve no you don't you don't need to know good and evil <laughs> just know life the tree of life is also in the midst of the garden you can eat of that tree you know and God did say you, you could eat of all the, the fruit trees, the trees of the garden. They're good for food and pleasant to the eyes. Yes, this tree of knowledge of good and evil was pleasant to the eyes. But there was an instruction that God has said, if you eat of it, you shall die. 
because knowledge of good and evil sin is is death is death to your soul it's separation from god so how is that life there was a contrasting trees and death yes knowledge of good but what what good that's still attached with evil evil attached with good it still taints the whole tree it taints the whole you know it's not pure okay so anyways you know and when this woman saw that the tree was good for food of course it'll taste good and that it was pleasant to the eyes yes i mean god created all the trees to it's you know they look good it's it's attractive most of the trees out in the garden were good for food so she saw that this one looked really nice and it's a tree to be desired this is now what the devil what he was telling her that it's desired is a tree to be desired to make one wise because you shall be like god knowing um, good and evil so she thought that was wisdom but in fact it was the opposite Okay, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Now, her husband probably saw that, oh, she didn't die. They probably were thinking physical death, which did come about. They did age, I'm sure, when they took, if they would have taken of every other tree, which was good for food and pleasant to the eyes, and the tree of life, which would have made them um, kind of, um, I feel like it's given them life, mortality, in a sense. And so they would never age. They didn't die automatically. Like, you know, God didn't pull an, an Ananias and Sapphira on them and they just dropped dead. But they spiritually died that day. At the moment that they ate of that tree, they spiritually died. And so he ate, Adam ate. And, and the eyes of them both were opened. And they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons to cover their bodies, their naked bodies. So they were ashamed. You know, with the separation of, you know, that spiritual death brought shame, condemnation, and they wanted to hide from God. The opposite of what God even desires to, for you to draw near, for you to hide yourself in him, you know, for safety, shelter. Um, he wants to be your satisfaction. He wants to feed you, he wants to nourish you, protect you as, you know, as a good shepherd does his sheep right but they sewed fig leaves um a poor attempt to cover their nakedness god was their covering i mean he set them in that garden with everything provided for they did not lack anything but yet they craved they they desired they lusted for that tree of knowledge of good and evil okay Let's go to uh, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, which is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So this reminds me of that episode in the Garden of Eden with the tree and the knowledge of good and evil. That represents the world, okay? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes because it looked good for food. The pride of life that, oh, this is, this is a fruit does does you know desire to make one wise um that i can eat of this tree I, I want to be like god they were even probably seeking immortality like god is like you know he, his spirit but he walked with them you know in the, in the cool of the day so he did manifest himself but it's like you know whatever god had they would desire but yet god had given that to them already Right, The tree of life was in the midst of the garden for them to eat. He did not say not to eat of that tree. He said the other tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Yet Satan begot, drew their attention away from life to death. And how? The lust of the flesh. 
the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. We're self-deception, the deceit of our flesh. It's, you know, our heart, our soul, our heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. That's why, um, I mean, he foreknew that this would happen in the garden. He foreknew, but... um, That, thank God he had a plan of redemption prepared for this very thing, okay? But this is a picture he wanted to show man, including us, that this is something that we're faced with every day as we are in this sinful flesh, in this body of sin. This is the struggle, right? This is the struggle that every person who is, who comes in contact with the gospel, which is Christ, in opposition to the things of the world, it's like, what will you choose? Will you stay in unbelief or will you believe the gospel? Will you believe in Jesus Christ, that he's the way, the truth, and the life, the tree of life? Okay. Um... I was trying to mention that there will be a time in the future in the millennial kingdom where things will kind of revert back to an Edenic, I don't know how to say it, but like time, the time of the Garden of Eden, God will be on the throne ruling and reigning on earth. I mean, Jesus Christ, who's God, um, this will be his millennial reign and he will rule with a rod of iron. What does that mean? It means that definitely there will be mortals on earth. And of course, they have their flesh to deal with. They're not immortal like the church would be when, they're, when the church is raptured, resurrection, resurrected. They're gonna tra- their bodies will be transformed into glorified bodies where the, the, the sinful flesh will be burnt up, will be done away with, right? Changed. So we won't have that component that so easily besets us. Right, because it's it's with us, it clings to us, but we won't have that. Glory be to God. But for the mortals, they'll still have have their flesh, their bodies. There, there, there will be this tendency to want to rebel, to want to go their own way, as opposed to what God has set forth or what He has commanded, what Jesus has commanded. You know. I mean, for the for for people for the Gentiles having to come to Jerusalem for certain periods of time, or they won't have rain, or you know their crops depending upon you know trap. But some you know they were like, why do we have to do this? And of course, it will be enforced because Jesus will be ruling with a rod of iron, and different things that will be put in place for their benefit. However. When Satan, who has been bound for one thousand is one thousand years, is released at the end of the millennium, those who, um, you know, he's going to go around prowling like a roaring lion, seeking whom to devour. He's going to deceive the nations again, and they're going to come with that decision of, will you choose the knowledge of good and evil, or will you choose the tree of life, who's right there, right there, ruling and reigning in righteousness? perfection right this is this is like a start con- like for those this is a thousand years a thousand years is a long time for people who are in our age our time now the tribulation is going to be like a purging the tribulation is going to um do he's going to do it with the wicked in that time so those who are wicked are not going to enter the millennial kingdom is those who have believed or and the remnant of israel will go in the gentiles who supported israel will go into the millennial kingdom those who are wicked are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. The um, false prophet and the antichrist directly in the lake of fire. The others, um, they'll wait. They will be awaiting their judgment uh, in the white throne judgment. They'll be in Hades. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that the time that we're living in will be ancient history. <laughs> will be history. So this is new generations we've born. And yet, when Satan is loose, they're still going to choose. Droves, millions, 
like multitudes will come against Jesus. And of course he wins. We know the end of the story. So this is a fundamental problem with the mortal flesh, with man. It's, it's just proven. <laughs> it's just proven through the Bible. But thank you, Jesus, for that, for that um, opportunity he has given us to choose life, to choose him. And by simple faith, okay, even those in the lane with the, the mortals, they still have to believe. You can't live without believing in Christ. There's no life apart from him because in the end, it's he is the Alpha and the Omega. All roads, not all roads, there's only one road and that's the narrow road to Christ. But what I mean by like, everything's going to culminate into you know him and his rule reign the new heaven new earth um the new jerusalem jerusalem coming down god with us um emmanuel that's what that means so it's like um his and there's even so much more that we don't even know that's not even written but the, when you see new heavens and new earth you know that it's going to be wonderful, um, wonderful times. And he'll just teach us, we'll learn more and more about God because he is great. He's m tremendous, humongous, vast, beautiful. Um, I, words just can't describe him enough, right? So that is awaiting those who have believed and trusted in him. For the church, we have our glorified, so glorified body, so we won't have that issue, that struggle with sin. But for mortals who have believed, it's still going to be that, you know, of course, subdued in, you know, in the millennial kingdom, but it's still going to be there. And they'll still um, have that to deal with. But the rebellion, that the, that battle of Armageddon is outright, like, like, anti-Christ type of rebellion, you know, look at like with a vengeance, <laughs> like unbelief, hatred for God. It's, it's going to be, it's not, there's no muddied, mud, muddied waters about that. It's like they make, make a choice. They did not believe. If they believed, they wouldn't be rebelling and, and going against, taking arms against Christ. This is going to be like a physical manifestation of their unbelief, okay? Where they go to war with, with Jesus, King Jesus. So we see here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So the world, this, this world as we know it, with its lust... And I just wanted to show that lust is, does mean strong sexual desire, self-indulgent sexual desire, but it means, it's like the verb, craving, appetite, or great desire for, craving, appetite. So the world and its cravings, appetites, strong desires, um, which include the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, that's all going to pass away. But what abides, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And what is the will of God? That we believe whom he sent. We believe in Jesus Christ. Faith in Christ. Simple faith. Simple trust in who Jesus is. And trusting what he has done for us. In completion, in totality, the finished work of Christ on the cross. That is how we do the will of God, the will of God, which is to obey the truth, which is to believe the gospel. And what happens? You are you abide forever in Christ, in God, and just in you know you will live forever because He is your life. And he is eternal. He gives you eternal 
life. So the world is passing away, right? So it's like, if you, what does it say in that passage where it says, like, if you gain the whole world and lose your soul, like, what's the point? So this world that is passing away, if you gain that and lose your soul, that's that's not worth anything. What what is the worth in that? How about you lose the world that's already passing away and gain Christ who will keep you both, you know, will keep your spirit, soul, and body. He redeems you totally that's i would rather have that you know it's not me keeping myself this flesh that i have with me you know i reckon it dead but even despite its ugliness right now <laughs> and its lusts i'm alive to god in christ my spirit is alive my soul is saved my body will be redeemed and i have faith and God is faithful to complete the work he started in me. I'm doing the will of God by believing, just believing, and I shall abide forever in the house of the Lord. And in fact, you know, that um, I think that psalm, abiding forever in the house of the Lord, God is building us as a habitation of God. We are living stones. So we are his temple so I abide forever in him and he in me. So it's it's really beautiful. Um, it's really, really, really beautiful. Because when we know that, um, when we know this truth, it's satisfying. God can, God is my satisfaction. I... When you are fulfilled in Christ, you are complete in him, the word says. You know that your desire and the lusts of the flesh are dead in Christ. They're dead in Christ. They've been done away with, crucified. The flesh has been crucified. That's the reality in Christ. That's the only way, you know, the world, you don't love the world when you are, when you, when you're in Christ. Because the world, it's on the broad path leading to destruction. But Christ is a narrow way. And it's about whether you, unbelief versus belief. That's really the, the dichotomy there. Um, I just wanted to bring that up because this this is a tale as old as time. This picture in the Garden of Eden. Christ versus, I don't know, how do I say it? Christ versus the world <laughs> or apart from Christ. Um, Christ not being are everything is is death and and damnation and condemnation shame all of the above right and that's in the knowledge of good and evil man trying to be like god trying to be their own god trying to make their own way when jesus is the way being deceived by lies deceiving and being deceived by the father of lies when Jesus is the truth, right? And he is the life versus death. So uh, I just, that was just in my head and, um, and I just thought, wow, this is truly, there's nothing um, under the sun, there's nothing new something new under the sun truly there isn't okay all right i love you guys you have a wonderful and blessed day bye-bye